All right, once again, we want to welcome everybody to today's Vaughn Company webinar, Foaming at the Mouth, a discussion on the causes and solutions for common foaming issues. In this session, we're going to discuss the different sources of foaming issues, common misconceptions and bad practices, and methods for foaming management. If you're new to our Vaughn webinars, we take the Q&A right there in the bottom right hand side of the screen. Just uh, type in your questions and those will come back to us and we will take the questions at the end of the webinar. If you're viewing this as a recorded session, just email us at info at chopperpumps.com. That's where you're going to uh, be able to connect with us and we will connect you with the right folks and get your questions answered. All right, well, let's, uh, let's bring in our, our two presenters here. First of all, we've got Senior Engineer for Rotomix, Eric Larson. He's been spot supporting Vaughn customers since 2012. Uh, welcome, Eric. Good morning. Good to have you here in the room again. And uh, let's see, to get us started here, let's welcome in Vaughn's Rotomix manager, Steve Macomber. Steve's been in the water and waste industry, um, protecting the water environment and public health for over 20 years. Steve, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Thanks, Scott. Hope everyone's doing well. Glad to be here. Well, the floor is yours, sir. Let's get started. Right on. All right. So we've done this a few times. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you again for coming back and joining us. This is our uh, our fourth Rotomix uh, product seminar. It does look like this is going to keep going for a little while, so we really want to collaborate with you, um, our fellow water wastewater professionals. It means a lot to us. Um, so let's make the most of it. Please reach out to Vaughn or me personally. Uh, I looked at the list, and I do know many of you personally, so just reach out and uh, let us know how we can best support you. Uh, we have been listening to the comments um, over these last few months, and this webinar today, somewhat similar to last time, is, uh, is a deep dive into, into uh, a unit process and sort of a byproduct of that with foaming. So if you get lost, if you get a text, uh, realize that you know this is a little bit meaty and you need to uh, get back and figure out where things are, please keep in mind everything is recorded, and you can find that on our website. So if you haven't seen the first a few webinars. They are recorded. Please check them out, including costs of over and under mixing design. So with that, I'll follow up at the very end, but we're going to let Eric uh, take it from here and let us know if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Steve. We'll get going here. Um, so I just kind of want to talk about the topics we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to talk about what foaming and rapid rise are and well, I, they're both issues that kind of have the same uh, eventual um, result, which is uh, you know burping or, or, or damage to a digester process um, uh, issues. Uh, they, they have kind of separate but similar causes, and I want to kind of differentiate between the two of them and, and provide a better context for, for when, when it's foaming or when it's rapid rise and the causes between the two. Um, the physical and biological causes of both of those issues, and there really are both physical and biological um, causes that really drive those two issues. Um, and, and generally, um, if you have, if you don't have both the physical and biological causes, you're you're generally not going to see an issue. And there's there's a couple reasons for that. And we'll get into that. Um, the factors you can control as an operator or in your facility to reduce risks and the importance of mitigation strategies for keeping foaming and rapid rise issues at bay and from impacting your treatment process. Um, before we get into the presentation, though, I have a couple more questions that I'd like Scott to put up on the screen. Um, these are similar questions to a survey that was done um, by WERF, and I'm very interested to see um, what the answers are and if they sort of match up with um, the results that they got from their survey. Um, and it also will help inform me about what is the topic of most importance to the audience today. Um, so we'll just give a second and let these kind of populate. Um, definitely interested in seeing uh, what kind of results we get. One thing I won't be able to see, though, at least not uh, immediately, is um, how the how the two questions uh, interact with each other in terms of, for those of you that have it in your digesters um, or, or have it in both your digesters and your aeration basin or aeration process, um, how that breaks out into the type of treatment you have in those aeration uh, 
processes and um, and that's kind of an interesting interplay uh, that we'll talk about a little bit more in depth um, and, and discuss a little bit more in, later on in the presentation. But I just kind of want to see um, how things are going. I think uh, I think for me the most interesting thing here is uh, we have a lot of other um, for treatment process and that might be a combination of me poorly wording um, process types or just a, a lot of uh, a lot of varying uh, treatment processes in, in today's uh, more sophisticated treatment facilities. So, uh, but definitely uh, we're seeing a lot more foaming issues in digesters than in the aeration basins, uh, although there's a fair number of people that have them in both. And uh, for the most part, the majority of facilities, and nobody's going to be surprised here, have activated sludge processes. So, um, you know, those are two things that I think uh, you're going to see a lot and, and are kind of backed up by other surveys that have been done by several different organizations in the wastewater industry. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I was very interested, but I'm not too surprised with the results we got. So with that, um, Scott will open it back up to the, uh, to the main presentation, expand that back out, and we'll start uh, moving through. All right, so what are foaming and rapid rise? Uh, foaming and rapid rise, you know, digesters operate optimally in a state of equilibrium between solid, liquid, and gas phases. And in general, the more homogeneous and stable your digestion process is, the more efficient it will be and the happier you will be as an operator. Um, so digestion converts solid organic matter into soluble compounds and eventually methane and CO2 gas. Foaming occurs when gas is unable to escape the solid liquid boundary. So when gas is unable to escape from the bulk fluid of the digester into your gas headspace um, and it's captured at that surface layer, that is foaming. That's where you're getting you know, bubbles built up on the surface and, and the generation of foam. Uh, rapid rise occurs when the gas is unable to escape the solid liquid volume. So rapid rise is gas being kept in suspension or kept in the digester volume itself. And, and foaming is when that gas is able to make it out of that volume, but then is trapped at the surface layer. And um, rapid rise and foaming are, are, are different in the sense of the mechanisms that trap foam at the surface are different than the mechanisms that trap gas in the volume. And determining which one you have can actually help you troubleshoot um, why you're seeing those issues to begin with. Um, so I think it's a very key distinction between the two um, to, to make that uh, those definitions and, and understand that. Um, so the anaerobic digestion process, just a really quick overview. Um, you'll, what is anaerobic digestion? It's a series of biological processes which microorganisms break down biodegradable material into methane, CO2, and energy in an anaerobic environment. Um, I've, this, for those of you that joined us for our Dealing with Indigestion series, you'll have seen this chart before. It's uh, from a great reference that I really like this chart. You have your standard hydrolysis, acid phase, and methane phase uh, breakdown of the process. Um, that I think most of you are, are fairly familiar with. And just uh, from a you know, solid, solid liquid gas standpoint, you know, you're going to see your solids and your composite uh, particulate material. You know, the solids that are going, but your suspended solids for the most part, um, are going to be your solid um, portion of your digester. Um, and those are going to be converted into soluble compounds, volatile fatty acids, um, amino acids, you know, various uh, water-soluble compounds that are more actively at attackable by your biological mass. And then those are going to be converted from a liquid into a gas in the formation of, of methane and CO2. And so, you know, you're feeding solids into your digester. They're being converted into soluble compounds. And then those are being converted into gas. And that's your volatile solids destruction, um, is taking those volatile solids and turning them into gas. And so, you know, as that process moves forward, you have to get that gas out of the digester and into your gas capture system. And that's where you can run into issues with foaming and rapid rise. Um, so the, the physical and biological causes of foaming and rapid rise. Um, for physical ca causes, and I, I almost went with a wastewater picture, but I thought, you know, beer is probably a more um, appealing image uh, for a presentation. So I went with beer, but uh, they're both, uh, they're both foaming in, in the same kind of regard. Um, so physical causes include reduced surface tension, 
Um, compounds like volatile fatty acids can reduce the surface tension of, of, on the surface of the digester and make foaming uh, much more stable. And the bubbles that uh, from the gas trying to escape the liquid uh, will stay around a lot longer. Um, filamentous bacteria also increase that bubble stability and contribute to foaming issues. And um, mixing energy and type, um, changes in mixing energy and direction can prevent gas bubbles from escaping into the headspace. Um, so if you have a digester that's mixing in one direction or, in, or at one mixing rate and you make a change to that, you're going to change the flow field within that digester. And if you were stably removing gas from the digester and allowing bubbles to escape into the headspace um, at one point and you change the dynamic, you might create a temporary uh, restriction in bubbles making it out of the digester, digester uh, sludge and into the headspace and start to uh, start to capture those bubbles for, for a small period of time, or you might completely capture them and, uh, and create some rapid rise scenarios, although that's, that's usually not the case. Generally, we're not putting enough mixing energy in uh, to force that in, in a long-term uh, situation. Um, gas mixing systems, however, can exacerbate foaming and rapid rise events if they're already happening, although there's really not a lot of data to say that gas mixing systems um, are going to cause foaming and rapid rise events by themselves in most cases. But uh, if, you have, if you have the conditions to allow for foaming to become a problem or you're experiencing a rapid rise event and, and those uh, have come into play, um, gas mixing systems are just going to add more gas into that sludge that needs to then eventually escape and make those problems worse. Um, so that's something to be thoughtful of if you have a gas mixing system. Um, other physical causes, gas headspace and piping. Uh, changes in pressure can upset equilibrium of that solid, liquid, and gas phase. And so uh, increasing pressure in your headspace can keep gas bubbles in suspension, uh, dissolve more CO2 and, and other gases into the digester sludge. And then if you decrease that pressure, um, you can cause those gas bubbles to rapidly come out of suspension. And if you have the right scenario for foaming to exist, or for other um, rapid rise or other characteristics, all of those gas bubbles coming out of suspension can definitely cause a, a foaming event or other issue. So th that's more of a physical phenomena. Um, you've also got fog and scum layers. Uh, these are more rapid rise uh, type scenarios. Uh, they prevent gas from escaping to the headspace. So if you have a very thick you know, fog or scum layer that's developed on the surface of your digester, um, and that gas is no longer able to pass through the surface into the gas headspace, it has to go somewhere and it's going to just continue to build up in the, in the digester volume. Um, this is most likely to cause um, a rapid rise or digester burping incident where you have gas build up for some period of time and then eventually it develops enough pressure to burst through that uh, scum layer and you see um, burping or some sort of overflow, um, maybe some sludge comes down the side of the digester, it pops the top, um, that type of event. Um, those, are, those are generally going to be uh, very dramatic, but uh, the sort of all at once type events. Um, and then we get into kind of the biological causes. Um, irregular digester feed, um, upsetting the biological process within the digester. Um, organic load rates um, above normal. So once you stabilize the digester on an organic load rate, um, you know, pounds of solid per day, um, as long or, or BOD or CBOD per day, um, as long as you keep that within about 20% of normal, you're probably not going to see issues. At least there's a, there's some data to support that. But anything more than that, if you're if you get outside of those those bounds, um, you might start to upset your digestion process and make yourself at risk for uh, for a foaming event. Um, batch feeding with significant time between feed cycles is also another issue, um, and then uh, which can cause spikes in VFAs and gas production. Um, so if you're feeding your digester, um, let's say you're feeding at primary in the morning and was at night or at the end of the day, and you've got six hours between feeds and then and then another 12 hours between feeds after that, um, what's going to happen is is you're going to be sh kind of shocking your biomass. With, with an abundance of food and then starving it. And um, those types of cyclical feedings can actually cause some, some imbalance in your digestion process 
that can lead to swings in VFA production and also in gas production that can lead to uh, creating the type of scenario where foaming can exist um, and, and other issues as well, not just foaming, but issues with pH, issues with um, digester volume, all kinds of things that are not very, uh, not very nice. Um, other biological issues, filamentous bacteria, coming back to that again. Filamentous bacteria has a, bio, has a physical aspect to it in the sense of um, how it interacts with the surface tension and bubble stability. Um, and, but the, as a biological cause, you know, it, we want to talk about the biological part of it, which is that they migrate to the digester from an extended aeration process or, or other um, aeration process. Um, they're able to survive um, in anaerobic conditions for up to 30 days. Um, there's data to support um, that in a mesophilic digester, you can see them through the entire um, digestion retention time. Uh, be stable and viable um, in that anaerobic environment. Um, they provide stability to digester foam um, and, and help build that bubble matrix and allow for it to, uh, to, to stay in, in play. And then, uh, so for filaments bacteria, I think there's, there's kind of an understanding, you know, are they the root of all foaming evil, for lack of a better term? You know, is, is filaments bacteria kind of have a hand in, in almost every foaming incident that exists. And based on a lot of studies, the, the answer is kind of maybe. Um, you know, they're present in most digesters with foaming issues. They're very common bacteria. Um, and there's really two main types. Um, there's, there's, there's a lot more, but these are the ones that kind of get the most notoriety. So you've got Nocardia and Microthix uh, parvicella, and I butcher that every time, so just Bear with me, but we all we all are familiar with these two bacteria at, at a minimum. There's a whole bunch more, but these two have the most rememberable names. The other ones have numbers or or type seven or you know things that are a little bit forgettable. Um, Nocardia is more common in warmer climates, so you'll generally see it south of the Mason-Dixon line, and then uh, Microthrix is more common in colder climates, so you'll generally see it up north um, around the Great Lakes and in the Northeast um, and they, you know, they, they both have temperature um, temperatures that they like to see that where they thrive. Um, and remember, we're talking about the temperature of the activated sludge or, or extended aeration or whatever, what other, whatever other process, aeration process is there. Um, it's the temperature at which that is happening that's going to drive what populations uh, kind of carry into the digester, not the actual digester operational temperature. Um, and so that's why you'll tend to see nocardia down south and microthrix up north. Um, so the WORF study uh, indicated that increased chance of foaming issues for facilities with activated sludge treatment um, was something that is, uh, is fairly likely. And that, that was actually uh, one of the key takeaways that I got um, from their survey they did. I think it was in 2012. Um, they found that uh, about 60% of facilities deal with foaming issues in their digesters. And of those, um, the majority of them were activated sludge processes, which is, you know, pretty, um, you know, everybody would expect to see that. It's a very common treatment um, process. But that if you broke it out and, and kind of looked at a per capita, many more activated sludge processes were seeing foaming issues than other types of process. So I want to say it was 60% of activated sludge processes we're seeing foaming issues where other types like trickle filters or rotary contact um, reactors were, um, we're only seeing a, a very small percentage of those end up having issues with foaming. And it really seemed to support this idea that, you know, filamentous bacteria are really causing a lot of these foaming issues um, in these processes and in these digesters, uh, which was kind of interesting. Um, but it's, it's, Something, something that also comes out of that data is that it's really more of a cause and effect. Filamentous bacteria alone are unlikely to cause foaming by themselves. Um, you know, definitely you could have a large enough buildup of filamentous bacteria in a digester um, that uh, no matter what you do, you're going to see foaming and it's going to be a problem. But generally, uh, what they do is they just make foaming events more likely and severe. Uh, foaming may happen in the absence of filamentous bacteria. There's definitely a lot of ways in which you can generate foaming um, without having filamentous bacteria present, but um, you know the, it's 
it's very likely that you're going to have filamentous bacteria if you have foaming. Um, and it's not likely to contribute to rapid rise events. Those tend to be um, more related to other issues, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But uh, I, just, I just really think it's a great connection to understand that even though you might have filamentous bacteria, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have foaming. But if you're not managing that, it can cause a lot of issues. Um, so the perfect storm is really increased organic load to the digest or changes in your organic load rate. And those are going to cause your acetogens in your acetogenesis and, and acid phase to convert that vo the more volatile comp components of that feed into volatile fatty acids at a very rapid rate. Um, once you build up those volatile fatty acids, if you have, um, or it, once you build those volatile, volatile fatty acids, they're going to reduce the surface tension, increasing foaming chance, and reducing pH at the surface layer. Filamentous bacteria like the lower pH, and they'll get caught in that uh, in that low surface tension and stabilize any foam that's generated. And so you really kind of see this interaction between unstable load rates and VFA production and filamentous bacteria using that environment and thriving and generating foaming issues and stabilizing them. And then once those VFAs build up, they might inhibit methane production for a little while, but eventually the methane's going to catch up and it's going to say, oh, I've got all of this food to convert to methane. And it's going to, it's going to see, you're going to see a spike in gas production that may lag the organic load feed um, by, you know, a matter of hours or days. Um, that then once you've created this foaming layer, you're then increasing gas production, which is exacerbating it, making it worse. Um, and when you look at a lot of case studies around digester foaming issues that have been presented at several conferences, um, when you get down into what was the root cause, you know, you, it's generally a mix of bad feed rates, um, filamentous bacteria being present in the digester, and um, unstable operation and, and process kinetics. And you know, that's something that I think um, is the most important takeaway you can have from this presentation is that digester foaming isn't just one particular issue. Um, it is a combination of multiple issues and multiple factors that might be interplaying in different ratios. But ultimately, it, it is something that once, it, once you create the conditions, it's very difficult to, to stop from happening. Um, and that increase, yeah, and the, as I said, the increased gas production quickly expands the foam layer, causing the foaming incident. Um, so ways to control and reduce foaming and rapid rise risks. Um, so controlling filamentous bacteria is, is, is kind of the number one. Um, if you have a filamentous bacteria and you're able to take samples from your digester and analyze them and are able to identify that you have filamentous bacteria in your digester, um, that is a, a good first step to addressing the risk of foaming in your facility. Um, increasing the food to microorganism ratio in your, in your aeration process can definitely uh, reduce filaments bacteria. They do not compete well with uh, your aerobic bacteria. And um, if you can maintain DOs in excess of, of one part per million or, and really two to three parts per million is, is even better. Um, you're going to see other bacteria out-compete the filamentous bacteria and really drive the filamentous bacteria um, levels down in your activated sludge process. It also will help deal with foaming in that process as well, although um, sometimes you might not be able to, uh, to control that ratio if you've got an older facility that's got a lot of capacity that isn't necessarily seeing the loadings that it used to, which is pretty common um, in, other, in parts of the country where um, you know, you might not be seeing the flows that you used to see. Um, but for the most part, flows are increasing in facilities, and it shouldn't be a problem to increase your food to microorganism ratio. Um, skimming excess foam is definitely a technique that works. Uh, getting those filaments of bacteria that rise to the surface and are, are supporting that foam layer, getting that foam out removes those bacteria. But be sure you're treating that prior to feeding the digester to destroy those bacteria. Because if you're skimming all of your filamentous bacteria off your activated sludge or other aeration process and then feeding those directly into your digester without deactivating those bacteria, you're just loading extra filamentous bacteria into your digester and just pushing that problem to another treatment process, one that's probably going to be a little bit more difficult to manage the effects of. Um, thermal hydrolysis processes, uh, there's, there's several on the market. 
Um, Canby probably is the most well known, but there's many others. Uh, th that pretreatment technique can destroy filamentous bacteria. And I'm uh, discussing with a bunch of our facilities that we've supplied mixing systems to that use THP processes. Um, for the most part, um, it's, they do not see uh, very many foaming incidences, although every once in a while there are rapid rise issues, but those are related uh, anecdotally to, uh, to mostly feed issues and, and overfeeding of the digesters um, or, or batch feeding of the digesters and upsetting the process. Um, but foaming is generally uh, at, a, at zero or a minimum. Um, other techniques are split phase, so acid methane digestion. I uh, know of a couple facilities that have uh, acid methane phase digestion, and you really see um, you know, the acid phase is going to be at a much lower pH, it's going to be a much more, um, uh, much better environment for that full hydrolysis to happen and the, and the acid phase to take place. And so you'll see those filamentous bacteria uh, degraded and deactivated and, and destroyed. Um, and thermophilic digestion can also inhibit and destroy filamentous bacteria. Um, and so even though thermophilic digestion, um, you'll see more aggressive digestion rates in, in, if they're operating properly, uh, you don't see as many foaming issues because they're inhibiting that filamentous bacteria, which is one of the potential causes of foaming. So they're reducing their chances of foaming issues in many cases and, and seeing less events. Um, so the other thing you can do is provide uniform organic loading rates. Um, inconsistent loading or high strength feed sludge can upset the digester and increase foaming risks. Um, you know, and just generally it'll upset your digestion process um, and, and can lead to a lot of headaches. Uh, continuous feed is best when possible. Um, you know, it's not always, but uh, in a lot of cases, if you can uh, change your process so that you're getting as close to continuous feed as possible, that's going to be the best condition for a healthy digester and reducing uh, the risks of foaming and other issues. Uh, and so multiple small feed cycles are definitely better than a fewer large feed cycles. Um, so anything you can do to make it a more consistent, more average feed rate, the better off you're going to be. Um, you know, really try to avoid doing daily feeds or, or, or things like that. Um, however you can, uh, try to lower the, the amount you're feeding at a time and increase the number of times you're feeding your digester throughout the day. Um, and also remember that not all feedstocks are equivalent. Uh, you know, balance your sludge loading um, and, and your organic load rate is going to look at that. You know, your primary, your WAS, and your high strength waste, not only are they at different, uh, different volatile solids uh, percentages and different loading rates, but also you're, they're going to be at different uh, levels of volatility in terms of your primary and your high strength waste are de generally going to digest much quicker than your waste activated sludge, which is going to be much more um, biomass. And so um, the best thing that you can do is, is really look at balancing those or blending those. Um, and, and blend tanks can also equalize your feed rate. So I really think blend tanks, if you have multiple feeds coming into a digester, However you can manage it, um, blend tanks can definitely uh, stabilize digestion and improve your digestion uh, uh, digestion process and make it more stable. Um, then controlling scum layer formation, um, that's another, uh, another technique. Uh, Pre-treat or limit feeding fog directly to a digester. Um, you know, you don't want to, uh, you know, push a big slug of fog into a digester um, all at once, you know, that's why in many cases you'll see a receiving station that has some level of capacity so that any fog that's being received can be uh, metered into a digester so that you're not just sending a whole bunch of fog in all at once. And there's definitely something to be said for, uh, for some level of pretreatment or hydrolysis of fog um, to break down um, the grease and other, uh, other fats into their components or long chain fatty acids. Um, so that they're more soluble and less likely to, uh, to create a surface layer or, uh, or build up. Um, definitely provide adequate mixing at the surface layer um, to address scum layer formation. And we'll talk about some ways that Vaughn can provide that at the end of this presentation and, and how we focus on that as a, as a mixing uh, process uh, equipment supplier um, through Rotomix. But uh, definitely adequate mixing in the surface layer can help control scum layer formation um, for sure. Uh, keep your overflows clear and functioning. Um, if you are unable to 
um, capture overflow um, from your digester, you're really rising, raising the risk that you're going to develop a scum layer A, but B, um, if you have an event that instead of overflowing, it's going to either pop the top or get into the gas capture system, which is going to cause even more issues. Um, and then, which gets into our gas collection system, ensure you have adequate headspace for the gas that you're producing and that if you're storing gas in your digester, that, uh, that you have enough space to store that gas at a reasonable pressure. Um, definitely, uh, definitely things to consider when you're looking at the design of a gas collection system. Um, keep overflows unobstructed, obviously, so that sludge is going through your overflows and not through your gas collection system. Because once you get sludge in your gas piping, you're going to have a lot of cleaning to do, and it's not going to be a very easy process. Um, ensure your biogas collection piping is adequate for the gas production rate. Um, you want to make sure that uh, your gas uh, piping is sized for the amount of flow that you're going to see through it and that you're not uh, overwhelming that process or creating unnecessary pressure in that system. Um, definitely something to, to keep in mind, um, especially for those of you that design these systems. Um, foam and rapid rise mitigation strategies. So we're going to, this is kind of the end of the presentation, uh, talking about how do we mitigate uh, foam and rapid rise. Uh, first of all, maintain proper mixing. Uh, you want to maintain a homogenous digester volume for the biomass. You don't want to see that process going through large swings back and forth between being inhibited with lots of VFAs and then, and then breaking all those down and generating a ton of methane all at once. Uh, you really want to see that process move at a very uh, stable, even rate. You want, to, you want to have equilibrium between your acid and methane phases. You want to have regular feed coming in to replenish um, that process and keep it moving smoothly. Um, it's going to be best for your biomass and best for your digester health. Um, you want to provide consistent pH and temperature so that you're not creating inhibitive uh, or, or temperature um, fluctuations that are going to reduce the efficiency of your biomass and allow for the process to become unstable. Uh, and you want to provide direct mixing at the surface to prevent scum layer formation in your digester and, and reduce the chance that you um, are unable to get gas out of your digester volume into your headspace, um, and, and really just reduce the chances of indigestion. Um, and this really gets back to the presentation from two weeks ago, which was uh, the, the dealing with indigestion presentation and really harping on the fact that you need to have a stable digester, and that's going to solve most of the issues that you'll experience with operation, is just maintaining stability of that process. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Rotomix mixing systems. Uh, it's a hydraulic mixing system using fixed nozzles and an external Von Chopper pump. So you can see a nozzle assembly there and the Von Chopper pump as well. Um, our design is, is a multi-zone mixing, which uh, creates, multiple, creates e even mixing flow across the tank diameter. Uh, we use multiple discharge points and create an even distribution of solids in the tank. And we use computer fluid dynamics, uh, computational fluid dynamics to model mixing system designs and ensure performance and that we're meeting the, the design specs uh, for good mixing and, and optimal mixing flow uh, in your digester volume. Um, it's, it's the most dependable way to model mixing system design performance uh, before you put the system in. And then providing foam suppression, uh, Vaughn provides a foam buster uh, assembly which evenly disperses droplets over the digester surface. Um, as much as you uh, should be putting in the effort to try to manage the causes of foaming in your digester and keep those at bay and maintain even stable digestion. The reality is every once in a while you're going to see, uh, see foam become a little bit of an issue, hopefully a minor one, but uh, having a foam buster or foam suppression system is going to definitely reduce the chances that those minor foaming issues become major foaming issues. Um, it helps control digester upsets and instability in your digester process. And we provide an optional scum nozzle which resuspends floatables and prevents stratification of the digester surface. I found that uh, the, the only real way to address a scum layer is to directly um, affect it with mixing, um, whether that is uh, directly turning it over or um, directly impacting it with nozzle flow um, or, or some other uh, mixing flow. Um, that is directly interacting with the surface because if you're if you're creating a mixing pattern in your digester, um, you're going to move the surface but not necessarily entrain it. 
and that can allow for stuff to collect at the surface that may be at a lower specific gravity or, or otherwise wants to float. Um, it can be, so the foam buster and, and the scum nozzle can be used with a rotomix system, but we also can supplement existing mixing systems to minimize foam and or scum buildups. Uh, these, are, these are assemblies that we can add to any existing digester that may be experiencing f nuisance foaming on a regular basis to help address those issues um, you know, to the extent that they may be happening uh, without having to completely um, take out the tank or replace the mixing system or do anything major. And these can be fairly minor capital improvements um, and something that we definitely uh, would recommend for anybody that's experiencing any issues. Um, so in conclusion, just to kind of recap, uh, you know, foaming is an issue for, for many digesters and, and real, the reality is it's an issue for more than half of digesters in operation. Uh, it's caused by unstable digestion, but there's other factors involved. Uh, it's not one single cause, but a combination of those factors that cause foaming issues. And it can make it hard to pinpoint exactly what's going on because um, you, may you, may, you may chop off one head of the hydra but the other two are, are still there and, and you're not able to deal with it just by addressing one single factor. Um, these factors are subject to a level of control though and we can deal with them through our operations and management of our facility, but uh, even in the best circumstances, foaming may still happen and so it's good to have an insurance policy uh, like the Foam Buster or other um, technologies to address foaming uh, that may occur. Uh, foam suppression can definitely help control Digester, uh, digester foaming, and uh, even um, in, in the best circumstances with good operation, it's still something that can definitely be a challenge for many facilities. Um, so with that, we're a little bit early here, but I'm hopeful that we'll have quite a few questions. Um, so with that, I think we can uh, turn it over uh, to, our, to our question board, and please, if you have any, uh, anything you'd like to add or any, uh, any questions, uh, please, Eric, uh, thank you, Steve now. Mack, over here. Just, uh, just before we jump into Q&A, Scott, if you don't mind, I just want to go back very very briefly and mention that uh, this is our fourth in our series of Rotomix presentations. So we've covered mixing in general. We've talked about mixing uh, tanks and basins, uh, specifically for high-strength waste, EQ basins, et cetera. Then we've talked about, uh, about proving the process of digestion, how we can uh, how we can help you with that, what to monitor, et cetera, and now we've gone over foaming. So all in all, I hope that you feel comfortable reaching out to us. Uh, we, have, we have some depth uh, expertise, not just uh, equipment manufacturing experience, but also uh, partnering with you with uh, 2,500 installations out there. So certainly we've seen, probably seen what you're dealing with. So feel free to reach out. If we can talk to you one-on-one -on -one or in a smaller group, we're happy to do that. Um, and yes, now we'd like to Hand it over to Scott and Stephanie. Yeah, Steve. How uh, if they if they want to reach out? I know you mentioned that you recognize a few names in the audience today, but uh, if they want to reach out, how best to reach out to you? Well, we've got let's see, LinkedIn, Facebook, email. <laughs> so we we um so so we've got uh, well we've got our general. If you go to our website, we're gonna we're gonna know what that you need to reach out to us. So I've got my email address, steve.macumber at chopperpumps.com. Um, but yeah, go to our website and it's all right there. Great, great, thank you. Yep, we do have a few questions. They're starting to come back. Joe, I see your, uh, your question right there, which is great. And uh, a few of them actually. Uh, let's uh, remind you that you can just type in your question right there uh, in the bottom of the screen and we'll get going on those. If you're watching this as one of the recorded sessions, Steve just talked through the whole library, um, but if you're watching this on our uh, YouTube channel or in our uh, education library, if you have questions, you can hit us at info at chopperpumps.com and uh, we'll get those uh, questions answered for you. And I will uh, we'll bring up the, uh, the conclusion slide here and let me point out a few things on the screen before we get through some of these questions. There's links in here for all of the videos, lots of great content in here, some downloads of case studies and whatnot. And in the bottom right hand side, we've got some other resources. You can get to our video page, our home page, um, right in the resources area, you just click the section that you want to go to and browse to, that'll open up a new window. Let's point out the participant certificate. That is where you can uh, download um, a certificate where it talks about today's session. 
and you just put in your information there and you'll be able to get a you'll get a PDF there with uh, that certificate there so Stephanie it looks like the questions are coming in fast and furious which is fantastic I'm gonna let you uh, start walking us through them all right hi everybody thanks for joining us I'm gonna start reading the questions um, first question here from Jonah are there any effective solutions to foaming that are not capitally intensive beyond good operational management and feedstock loading consistency? For example, biological micro, microbial additives products. Um, well, I think uh, I think from a, there's definitely things on the market. I I think you really get into the area of do you want to spend capital or do you want to spend operating? Um, because if you're d doing a microbial additive or, or, or something like that outside of just general operation in, in trying to manage your biomass, um, if, if you're consistently adding an additive, um, you know, several different things would be uh, different enzymes, different uh, ferric chloride is one that seems to come up but is never recommended by any anybody but still gets used. Um, there's... There's a whole bunch of different schemes, but most of them are going to involve the regular dosing of fairly expensive chemicals or enzymes or some other, um, you know, you know, everybody's everybody's seen the five thousand dollar chemical tote, and that you go through once a week. So I I think there's really a level of of you can do things that aren't capitally intensive, but um, you know, outside outside of just normal good operational mechanic mechanics and process. Um, you know, you're really just trading off capital for operational, um, which, you know, some people prefer. But I, I definitely think, um, you know, and maybe I'm biased because we, we sell it, but, um, you know, I think a foam buster or some other, uh, some other direct um, effect is something that might have a capital cost associated with it, but it's going to be fairly minor and it's going to last for a long time and, and really not have that operational cost component that can really add up over time. Okay, thanks Eric. Jay asks, how do you control flow to the scum buster? For example, does it operate with the lower nozzles in service? Does it run continuously? So those are two things uh, that uh, it depends on the system, um, but generally in a digester where you've got a stable level um, the scum buster would be uh, piped in on the same pump with the rest of the rotomix system. Um, and in some cases, uh, in fact in most cases, what we'll do is we'll provide an isolation valve um, external to the digester where you can isolate off the scum and foaming uh, assemblies uh, so that you can provide for use with both the mixing and those or just the mixing. Um, another th thing we can do is provide a separate pump that drives the scum and foam nozzles um, that is separate from the mixing system so that you can operate those without the mixing. Although I would really recommend that you're, you're continuously mixing. And just, you know, something I, that, that bothers me um, that I just want to put out there is if your digester is designed to be a, a continuously stirred tank reactor design and you're basing your permitting off of that, you really need to make sure that you're maintaining continuous mixing and continuous uh, active volume. Um, if you're turning off your mixing for extended periods of time and converting your digester into, into more of a uh, non-mixed uh, decanting style, uh, you're really not continuously stirring it anymore and you're not operating it at its design. So that's, that's something that, you know, everybody's different and, and your permits are different, but, uh, you know, something to keep in mind is if, if you're permitted as a continuous, uh, continuously stirred tank reactor design and you're not operating it that way, that can potentially cause some issues for you down the road. Joe asks, with your system, how much freeboard capacity or percent volume do you recommend for gas space in a digester? Interruptions to mixing due to power outages or mechanical failures are imminent and rapid rise can create an emergency condition very quickly. You know, I would uh, I would leave that up to a design engineer. I think freeboard is going to depend on a lot of different factors, and providing a a hard and fast uh, answer to that question is probably not going to be realistic. Um, you know, most systems, uh, if you have a gas dome um, or or some sort of dome uh, lid or or cover, you're going to have a decent uh, amount of capacity just in 
that geometry. Um, and so that might provide a decent amount of space. But it's also going to depend on how much load you're feeding into your digester, what the digester percent solids are, how volatile those percent solids are. Um, there's a lot of different factors that can uh, influence um, what type of freeboard and how much space you need. And uh, I really don't think um, I don't think it would be uh, appropriate for me to try to uh, provide a hard and fast answer to that because I think the answer is it really varies um, and it's going to be unique to each facility. But uh, I definitely don't think that um, in general you need to have an obscene amount of freeboard in a digester. I think if, if you're operating if your operation is stable, um, even if you have a power outage, most facilities are going to have redundant power, but even if they don't, um, you're also with, with the loss of mixing, you're also going to lose um, your feed. And while you absolutely can see a rapid rise, um, you know that's something that uh, if you're going to see it, uh, I don't know if if you can provide it. If you're going to see it in a, in a very aggressive manner, I don't know if you can provide enough freeboard for that. That's that's something that's going to be very difficult to 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 keep from being an Eric, issue. Eric, let's uh, let's continue to uh, cruise through some of these questions. Um, Joe asks, what are the most common qu causes of rapid rise expansion? Do chemical contaminants exasperate it? If so, which ones? I think that uh, for the most case, rapid rise is going to be caused by a large increase in gas production, and that can either be physical or biological. Um, it's going to be um, a whenever you see a large swing in the rate of gas production by your methogens, um, which means that they have gone from being in an inhibited state to being in a position where they are in right in the in the pH and temperature range they want to be in, and with ample food. Um, you know, however that happens, um, that's going to cause a, a spike in gas production that can destabilize a digester and create um, an a, a increase in digester volume from that gas that's being produced. Um, and there's also the physical side of if you have changes in, in headspace pressure that are fairly significant or, or other uh, changes to mixing energy that, that uh, are fairly severe and cause a change in uh, gas holdup. Uh, you can definitely see rapid rise from that. But I think in most cases, you're going to see rapid rise from uh, a big slug of feed going into a digester that's very uh, volatile and seeing that then uh, inhibit the methogens, convert all to VFAs, and then get buffered, and the, and the methogens just take off. And if you have ever fed a whole bunch of feed in, of high organic load feed, like a big slug of Fog or something into a digester and watch the uh, the gas. You'll see your you'll see your uh, your volatile acids spike if you take if you take data from that. But then you'll see your methane spike on your on your on your gas meter, and uh, right. that's that's usually just if remind you guys that uh, our it. question and answer pod right there below the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. We also have an area. If you guys have other topics for our webinar series, please put those in there. We've gotten some great suggestions already and working up the next group and then also all of the resources that are available on the screen. Uh, Eric, uh, Phil asks, do you see any role for available enzymes for use in improving overall digestion and preventing crusting in surface uh, of the digester mass? You know, I think that uh, there's definitely a role for enzymes to play, um, but it's, it all comes down to cost. Uh, so, you know, obviously, uh, you know, en adding uh, enzymes to a digester or even to the sludge prior to feeding to a digester to try to improve that hydrolysis rate and improve the digestion um, uh, rate as well, um, you know, it's definitely something that's, that's viable from a biological standpoint. But from a cost standpoint, I think uh, you can quickly run into a situation where um, it's not providing good value to the ratepayer, or if you are a private facility that's producing gas as from a market from a market standpoint um, and marketing that gas um, or other or other byproducts of digestion, uh, you're probably going to see that really not be a good value. Um, 
I, where you really see enzymes is when you have a situation where without them uh, it would be very difficult to maintain um, stable operation and they become an operational necessity. Um, but again, you know, that's, that's going to come at a, a fairly significant cost. Um, you know, you're talking about a very large volume for uh, traditional digestion and providing enough enzyme that you're going to have any impact on that is going to be uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit to add. Um, so I don't I don't work in that necessarily. So I don't I don't want to say that they're they're not something that can provide a very meaningful role. But I've only seen a couple systems that utilize them with great success. Um, and and most of it is not that they don't work, but it's just the cost associated is fairly significant, and uh, if you don't if you don't absolutely need good. them, it's probably good. not a good value. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let's see. Peter jumps in and asks, uh, "Can you elaborate on VFA creating foaming?" Absolutely. So uh, VFAs, volatile fatty acids, are uh, hydrophobic, but they also are um, a surface tension reducing uh, substance or a surfactant. So um, you know, you look at you know soap making and things like that. You know, you'll see volatile fatty acids there. They they just reduce the surface tension of the sludge in the digester. And you know, I, I think there's I'll, I'll touch on another subject that I didn't cover in the presentation, but I feel like there's this misunderstanding that over mixing causes foaming by frothing the surface and creating foam, sort of like if you were to take soapy water and, and whisk it. And the reality is mixing velocity in digesters is not high enough to really entrain um, gas and create foam that, in that way. Overmixing can take what is an inhibited and, and stalled digester and jump start it, which then will over overproduce gas and, and create foaming issues. Um, because likely, if, if the process has been stalled, it's been stalled by VFA toxicity, uh, creating um, pH issues for the methogens. And as you mix that, you even that out um, and allow for those to take off again and, and, and be more, more efficiently produce methane. But uh, for the most part, VFA by itself is not necessarily going to create foaming, but it definitely will contribute to foaming um, by lowering the surface tension and creating an environment where other factors uh, can can start to kind of dig in and, and create Good question. Um, and, a fairly uh, significant Thanks for jumping issue. in there, Peter. Um, I, there's still a couple more questions here, and I'll let Stephanie uh, kind of walk us through those. But just remind everybody, uh, just uh, continue to go through the Q&A pod there and, and uh, feed them through. It's great to have Eric and, and Steve and Stephanie on the line to uh, answer your questions. Uh, that's why we do them live, so that you can ask your questions. And uh, if you are catching this on the recording side, uh, just uh, you can always email us at info at chopperpumps.com. All right, Stephanie, what other questions do we have here? Oh, I know she's here. Maybe the audio just hasn't clicked in. Well, let me let me go ahead and go with, uh, with Brian's question. Um, how well does the foam buster work with fog layers? So foam buster, foam buster works uh, pretty well with foaming. I would recommend a our, our scum nozzles, um, which so for most foam buster assemblies, you'll have a foam buster that's above the surface, and then directly below that, you'll have a scum nozzle which is directly at the surface, you know, within a couple feet of the surface layer, and uh, it works very very well at breaking up fog and scum layers. Um, we've had applications where We've, in, we've uh, after the fact, installed a scum nozzle in a digester that maybe had other mixing or, or other things from, the, from a roof hatch and broken up seven, eight, nine foot scum layers uh, over the course of a few days. Um, you know, that direct action of the, of the scum nozzle on that surface um, really cr provides some good velocity at that surface and helps to break up those layers and re-entrain that sludge, re-wet it and get it um, get it back into the digester volume and keep it from building up. Um, I definitely would recommend it um, as something to consider, and we definitely like to talk with anybody that maybe experiences those issues to look at how we might be able to help solve that. Because I know that that can be a very serious uh, issue for a lot of facilities, and uh, the reality is, is adding a adding a scum nozzle or a foam buster is a pretty 
cheap uh, cheap alteration to make from a capital standpoint. Um, definitely cheaper than taking the digester down and removing it, um, uh, which which you know could take could be a quarter million dollars. All right, for I a think I've made my way back, everyone. I'll go ahead and an uh, ask this last question if you can all hear me. Um, Joe asks. We have problems with air locking, heating, recirculation pumps at times. These are centrifugal and rotary low pumps, which will lose prime within minutes of being flushed with clean water. Can anything be done with your system to reduce this phenomenon? Is more mixing energy or less mixing energy a solution? You know, that's a tough one to answer without more information. i definitely love to connect after uh, we get done here, but I'll, I'll talk kind of generally. Um, if you're seeing air locking in your heating recirculation pumps, um, you know, that's not necessarily um, surprising. Uh, definitely with digesters in general, you're going to have entrained gas, um, both dissolved gas, and then also you're going to see gas production, especially if um, you have, uh, if your heating recirculation system isn't running all the time, uh, when it's not running, that the sludge is still digesting within the piping and you'll be producing gas and you might be binding uh, that gas in the pumps, uh, whether the centrifugal or rotary lobe, um, and that could be causing a lot of issues for you. Um, there's a couple different ways you can deal with that. Uh, definitely a auto valve uh, an, an air valve uh, will will definitely be um, a good thing to, to consider uh, wherever you have some high piping so that you can let that air out of the system. Um, there's a couple different uh, brands on the market that provide good wastewater air release valves. Um, and then, uh, you know, other things you could look at if you really can't tackle the issue or can't deal with it, um, you know, you could look, look at uh, self-priming pumps or things that are going to... Uh, be able to operate with gas and push that gas out. But if you're getting gas after having after water flushing, um, that tells me that there's probably a, there's probably a, an issue with the piping. Um, and I can't answer that without having a much more detailed look at your at your layout. And and realistically, you know, I might I'm I'm not necessarily a piping guy, so I might I might not necessarily be the uh, the most uh, the best person to look at that, but it's definitely something that uh, we'd be we'd be willing to look at. <laughs> I can't guarantee I'll be able to fix it. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. All right. No, no, I, I love it. I, your honesty is amazing. I what do you it. want me to lie? We can guarantee that we'll try. <laughs> there you go. That's a good guarantee. That's a good guarantee. All right, let's uh, one last chance yeah. here before we do a quick wrap up. If uh, you guys have any questions left, and there's still a lot of you left in the room, which we uh, love. I mean, that's the quick Q and A part that is always uh, the best part of the presentation. Uh, if you have any last questions, drop them in that box in that Q and A area. Otherwise, we're going to go around the room. And um, Steve, any uh, any last uh, thoughts or comments before we wrap up? Oh, only one last comment is just back to that question you asked me about how to get in touch with us. Obviously, uh, low underhand pitch there across the plate. You know, it's not Googling us. It's not Facebook. It's info at chopperpumps.com. If you need anything, we'd love to hear from you, and, and we'd be happy to get right back to you. We appreciate your time. Thanks, Steve. Stephanie, any last words here? Uh, no, I just appreciate everybody taking the time to join us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you may be listening in from or, or in the middle of the night by chance. Um, we appreciate it. Um, we've got another uh, webinar about portable bypass pumping coming up on July 21st. Registration will be open soon for that. Um, and any of these webinars that we've already uh, recorded are available on our website at chopperpumps.com forward slash education. So you can always uh, catch ones that you may have have missed in the past. Um, but again, thanks um, to everybody for joining us. We really appreciate you taking your time to listen. All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Eric, uh, why don't you go ahead and close us down here? Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I really have enjoyed uh, the last couple presentations, talking a little bit more in depth about digestion and other processes on the solids handling uh, side of a wastewater facility. And uh, I hope you all got a lot out of this. And if you have any questions for me or you want to bring 
if you're if you're a university student or professor doing research, or if you're an operator that's got an interesting uh, process process or an interesting uh, interesting uh, question, uh, I definitely would love to to hear about it. Uh, you can reach me at eric.larson at chopperpumps.com. And uh, I just want to Thanks, Eric. Thank I want to clarify one thing real quick on that email address. Uh, it's Eric week. with a K, not with a C. So that's uh, an important. And Larson with a no. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. Larson well, everybody, yeah, thank you, Stephanie, important. Steve, Eric, Doug, and Phil, and Peter, and Brian, everybody with your great questions. We appreciate your guys' participation. Like Stephanie said, we're going to be back here towards uh, the center of of July, July 21st or so um, with our next webinar. So with that, we're, uh, we're going to close the doors and uh, wish you guys a, a great rest of the day, morning or afternoon, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thanks, everybody.